Okay. Pause, please. Come on. Done. Okay, right here. Let me share my screen. Start the broadcast. All right. Okay. Here we go. That'll, that'll start. That'll do it now. Okay. Uh, so as far as announcements go, welcome everybody. All right. So we have a nice intimate class here. Uh, let me see. So as far as announcements, this is what the end of week three. So we'll be doing things, um, working on content related to section 1.3. The big piece of information is that exam one will become available this upcoming Sunday, right? So I think I, I think I scheduled it to become available this upcoming Sunday at 11, 11 a.m. And it'll be due the following Sunday. So seven days later at 11, 59 p.m., right? That's basically midnight going from Sunday to Monday. Um, and it's, it pretty much follows the same rules as far as, you know, unlimited attempts. The system is set to take your highest score. Uh, with the exams though, one, one piece of information I need to share I want you to be aware of is that I think it has prerequisites where you need to pass the corresponding quizzes for weeks one, two, and three, right? So in order to access exam one, you would have had to pass the quiz for week one, quiz for week two, and quiz for week three. So now each quiz is only like five questions, right? You should know, you should be aware of that by now. Uh, that means you would have to get four of the five correct for, again, for quizzes week one, two, and three in order to access exam one. Um, I do encourage you to like start on the exam as soon as possible. You don't want you don't want the exam to be available, but then you can't start because you haven't done the prerequisites, right? And then, so like if you started on it this Sunday, you, you can ask questions about the exam when we meet on Monday and Wednesday, right? So during exam weeks, I'm usually just on the call, like kind of in silence. And I really, it's really just to get attendance credit. And I really just make myself available for, so you guys can ask questions about anything, right? We can talk about next week, you know, while we're taking the exam, we can talk about anything that's on Pearson. So either a current exam, a quiz or homework or anything that's on Pearson. Um, that's the main piece of information there. Also, so that, so, you know, that's Pearson. We access it through Blackboard. Also, you just want to be sure that you're, um, I wish I had reminded my class from last, last, sec last session. But uh, be sure that you're working on your, on your lab, your online Alex lab with Dr. Lamar, right? So that's a that's a separate component to this course. It's worth 10% of our overall grade. Uh, to find that information when you log in, when you arrive to our main landing page on Blackboard, on the left-hand side, there's gonna link this, there's gonna be a link that says online Alex lab. You click on that link, you contact, uh, the, the contact information for the facilitator is there. It's, it's, run, it's facilitated by my colleague, Dr. Lamar. And basically, whatever it is that she tells you you need to do, that's what I expect you to do. And then I want to say at the midterm, at the midterm and the final, she'll give me a grade for each of the students. Um, and I'm just going to take that grade and scale it to 10% of your overall grade. Um, I think those are the main pieces of information. As usual, this is online remote asynchronous, so you're not obligated to stay. Uh, because you've made it into the Zoom, that means you've gotten your attendance grade for today, which is the minimum that I require from each student um, with this being online remote asynchronous. This is being live streamed to my YouTube. And uh, my intent for today is to go through as many homework questions regarding section 1.3 as possible. Now, again, we, we don't have to stick with 1.3. We can go to any of the other sections, uh, like 1.1 1, 1 or 1.2, 1, but, you know. So as usual, if you have questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or type in the chat um, and we can talk about it. Let me pull up the assignment. Wait, so um, We need to find out where we have a... Uh, uh, yeah, so um, I have a question. Yeah. So, um, so when working on the exam, we can like, mm -hmm. during that week, we can ask you questions about it. Okay, so another thing about the exam that I think I didn't mention is that each time you take the exam, it's going to be a completely different set of questions, right? So you still want to have some level of confidence going into it, 
um, especially if we're only together for like 50 minutes at a time, there's only so much we can do in 50 minutes, where each student is pretty much getting their own unique exam, right? Uh, so we don't have that many questions remaining. We can go back, because I know there's some questions in previous sections that we didn't finish. But yeah, so, but we do meet twice in a week. You know, I don't mind. You can ask questions about it. We, we can attempt it because if you attempt it again, it's going to be a completely different set of questions. It's not that the questions have been shifted around. I mean, it's a completely different set of questions. It's the same content, but, you know, it's, it's permutated or whatever. It's like it's basically drawn from a pool of questions. Right. So I don't. But, yeah, I don't mind. It. Otherwise, we just I'll be sitting on the call like in dead air. Right. Usually during exam weeks. I just get on the Zoom. Um, I get I get make sure everybody gets their attendance credit, and then I'm just kind of sitting on the call in silence, waiting for somebody to ask a question. That's usually what I do for exams. I see where we made our way through most of the questions from from us from this assignment together. Um, you know, I do want to remind you that there is a, a full lecture recording of like the content uh, pertaining to this. Also, I do another thing is I intend to. Um, there's a link that's already available on our Blackboard. It's, it's like the Dropbox. It says the box link um, where all the stuff that you see me writing. I intend to make it available once I get it up to speed. It'll basically be updated each time we meet, right? So, like when we finish class, I'll load the PDF copy of all the stuff you saw me writing. I'll load it into the box link. Um, that link is available. I just haven't put the documents there. So I just had to update it. And what you'll find in there, the first folder will be um, a student folder that has a student notes. And basically it's the same thing. It should, it should match the notes that are in the presentation. But then when you get to the examples, the examples are going to be just a question with no supporting detail. So it is a good idea to, you know, attempt those examples in advance once you have access to them. And then once you start making your way through the presentation, fill in, fill it in with like a copy of the instructor notes. Usually I make the instructor notes available on that day of the sessions. For, so for instance, two weeks from now when we start 1.4, that's when the instructor notes for section 1.4 are gonna be available. But my intent is to make the student notes available for all the sections for the entire semester, right? So that's, that's something that's coming down the pipeline. It should be available before we end exam one, right? Okay. So as usual, if you have questions, feel free to either unmute yourself to get my attention or type in the chat. I do check the chat periodically. Uh, and let's just kind of make our way through some more questions here. And again, if you have questions, just unmute yourself. Uh, let's see. So this comes from section 1.3, question 45. Uh, we have the access to answer the questions about the following function is the point two comma five on the graph, right? So what it's saying is that when X is two, is the corresponding Y five, right? So with that, what I'm gonna do is use my trusty Dusty Rusty. I can get it to work. Reload, refresh. Okay, I'm gonna use my calculator. So in the upper left-hand corner, I'm gonna to go to my Y equals and type my 2x squared minus x minus 1. Okay. And basically, we're saying when x is 2 is the corresponding y5. So I'm going to quit to so go back to the home screen. On the right-hand side of the calculator, there's a button that says clear. To the left of the clear button is a button that says VARS. I think that's shorthand for variables. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to go to the right to go to y variables. I'm going to click on number 1 for function. And then click on number one again to call on the function that we just inserted. So then I'm going to put an open parentheses and I want it to evaluate when x is two. So then when it's x two, if I hit enter, that's the corresponding y, which is five, which is what we wanted. So is this point on the graph? For that one, we would say yes. Check. Okay. So then for part B, it says if x is negative two, what's the corresponding y? So all I'm going to do is hit second enter to call on what I had before and replace that two with negative two. Okay. And then it'll get, we get a corresponding Y value of nine. So then we get nine here, right? And you can confirm it. That's not a nine. You can confirm it by doing it manually, right? Right. 
So then uh, two times, negative two times negative two is positive four. Four times two is eight. Eight minus a negative two is 10, because it's a double negative. 10 minus one is nine, right? And you know, I didn't write it out, but we could. I'm gonna hit check the answer. List the point on the graph. So if when X is negative two, Y is nine, then that means that the order pair is negative two comma nine. Okay. So if our Y value is uh, negative one, what's X? Okay, so if we're fortunate, we can use the, the calculator. Um, this, I think this does have a solve feature. I'm not fully sure how to use it, but what I'm gonna do here, I wanna use the table and just do a quick view, right? It says if our, now we got lucky, right? Cause it says when the Y is negative one and the very first entry shows us the result. It says that when X is zero, Y is negative one. Let me see now, actually there might be a danger there because we might have more than one negative one. But I think that might be it. We have a U-shaped curve. Looks like, okay, you know what? Um, I feel like we're gonna be missing some results there, so I'm not gonna rely on that. Let, I think we need to write this one out. Cause I think we're gonna be missing a zero. So let's, we're gonna be missing a result. So to capture that missing result, let's write this out. Just getting a copy of it for our notes, come on. Here is pretty good. Come on. I kind of need to restart my device. It's been on all day. And it's still totally doing a tantrum. But we're almost there. Like, I definitely got my money's worth out of this device. Like, I was avoiding the iPad, but then it dawned on me I could use it for teaching remotely. So now I use it for like gaming, mostly gaming and teaching. I just flow between the two, right? Okay, so we left off on part C where we have that Wi-Fi. I think we did find one, but I think we need to write it out. So our f of x is two x squared minus x minus one, right? And they're asking us to find x when f of x so basically when this is equal to a negative one, right? And we're gonna solve. So if we're gonna solve, let's go ahead and set it to zero by adding one on both sides. If we do that, we'll get two X squared uh, minus X. I think that's a zero equals zero like this, right? So then from here, we can factor out X on, on both sides. I mean, from both terms then we're gonna be left with two X minus one equals zero. So after factoring, we have two or more things that multiply to give a zero, then we can use what's called the zero factor property. So when we have two or more things that multiply to give a zero, we set each thing to zero and solve. So we say X equals zero or two X minus one equals zero. Okay, I think the left hand one is already solved for us. And if we solve for X in the second one, we add one to both sides, divide by two, X equals a half, right? So on that table, you know, we were missing a result. I was like, you know, Spidey Tense was tingling. I was like, wait a minute. I think we might be missing a result. So if we had just submitted zero, then we, we would have missed it, right? So we got that these two values um, will make X zero. Now we, now we can confirm the right if we go back and just pass them through our function so for instance when x is zero we should get negative one so when x is zero come on what's the deal we get our negative one and then when x is a half we should also get negative one Oops. All right. So again, if we had tried to use the 
the table the way we did before, we would have missed the one half. X intercepts, so then zero and one half. So let's submit these, this one. Zero and one half. So, yeah, my device is like, man, it's been a long day. <laughs> Zero comma one by two. Okay, I think that looks good. The domain. So this is a, wait a minute. What's the points? So then, oh, okay. So when X is zero, the corresponding Y is negative one. And when X is one half, the corresponding Y is also negative one. And then the domain, so this is a polynomial. In general, the domain of, once you identify something as a polynomial, the domain is all reals. Polynomials are a finite sum of monomials. And a monomial is something where we have like a real coefficient times some variable to some non-negative integer exponent, right? So the exponent on the variable is gonna be something like to the power of zero, to the power of one, power of two, power of three, something like that. Um, okay, let's go like this, like this. So the domain is all reals, negative infinity to infinity and beyond. Check the end. Okay, list the x-intercepts. Okay, so to find the x-intercepts, we have to set y equal to zero, right? So let's hop back here, and there's a let's get a copy of the original. And we have to set the original, set it equal to zero and solve. So that's part E. Uh, okay, it's tempting to try to, to so we want to factor this, right? It's tempting to jump to the two parentheses, but notice the leading coefficient is not a one, so it's not so straightforward. We need to use, um, I, I like to use this technique called the AC method of factoring. So basically say it's A times your C. In this case, it's gonna give us negative two. Um, I think those are the only factors. So from there, I'm gonna use this technique called the box method for factoring. In the upper left-hand corner goes the two X, the leading term, the two X squared. In the bottom right-hand corner goes our constant term. And then uh, here, instead of it, we look over two numbers that multiply to give us negative two and add to give us negative one is negative two and one, right? Because negative two times one, sorry, wait a minute, is yeah, is negative two. And then negative two plus one is negative one, right? So then we got now that we, we kind of put that in the proper order. We put those on the other diagonal, right? And we we're rewriting that negative X using the two numbers that we found. So it's gonna be negative two X and a plus a positive one X, right? So then once we have this, now we're ready to get to the final result. If we, if we look at these two guys here on top, what do the two on top have in common? They both have two and they both have X. So we can factor out two X from those two. Uh, what do these two have in common? If they don't have anything in common, then it would be a plus one. It would just be one. What do these two have in common? They both have X. Okay. And what do these two have in common? It gets negative one. Okay. So then our claim Copy this, 
open here. Nope, oh, undo. That's fine. And let's paste. Our claim is that this now factors into 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. And you can check by multiplying. 2x times x is 2x squared. Um, outer, that's going to be a negative 2x. Negative 2x plus x is negative x. And then last is 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Okay. So then now we're ready to apply the zero factor property when two or more things multiply to give a zero. Either this equals zero or this equals zero. All right, you said he's seen a zero and solve. So from the one on the left, we if we solve, we subtract one and divide by two, negative one half. The second one, we add one to both sides, that's one. Okay. So then what do these results mean in the context of the original question? I think these are the x-intercepts. So what this means is if we plug these into the original, the output should be zero, right? So let's just check that really quickly. I think we got it here already. So for instance, if we insert a negative one half, the result should be zero. If we insert one or evaluate when x is one, the result should be zero, okay? So these are x-intercepts. This one, come on. There we go. I think we got a negative one half. I'm forgetting already. Negative one half and one. Negative. Nope. Okay. Negative one half, comma one. Okay. And then for the wiring step, the wiring step, I, I personally, when it, given the choice, I usually like to do the wiring step first because oftentimes it's much easier. To find a wiring step, we said x equal to zero, and you'll quickly see that the output is negative one. Thank you for that. Let's go to the next question. Again, if anything is not clear, you have to unmute yourself to get my attention and we can talk about it. Let me just check the chat. Uh, let me see here. Okay, we're okay there. Okay, it's no, it's no worries. Um, yeah, if possible, you know, just generally, I mean, again, uh, the minimum required is I just need you guys to log in at each session to get your attendance credit. Again, you don't have to stay, but I know if you're sick, that might be a bit much, but you know, that's just to keep everything simple and to just kind of cover yourself, just, just log in and try to get your credit. Uh, but I don't want you stressing about that either though. Just just do the best that you can and it'll be, it'll be okay. So we have this image, right? Can we, can we make it any bigger? Okay. Refers to this graph shown to the right, find the domain of F, right? So the domain. Okay, so in a pictorial representation like this, the domain is going to be the very left to the very right, right? Uh, another way of visualizing the domain, if we were to take this image and squish it vertically onto the x-axis, the domain is going to consist of wherever is, is squished onto the x-axis, right? So the very left, it looks like the, the furthest left value is when x is negative eight. And then as we make our way to the right, it, you might be tempted to say eight, but notice there's an arrow. So the arrow means just continue in a straight line that way. So if it just goes in a straight line off to the right, that means it goes off to infinity. So the domain, the very left to the very right, it goes from negative eight to positive infinity. Okay, now it looks like the negative eight is included. 
<laughs> it almost just anyway, we, we caught it. It looks like the negative eight is included. Uh, so it means it gets a square bracket. Square, bra square bracket means we include that number. A parentheses means we don't include that number, right? So negative eight and then the far right is infinity. Infinity always gets a parentheses in this context. But there was gonna be more there. Use the graph to find the indicated value of the function. So when X is three, so looking at the graph, when X is three, it looks like the corresponding Y is one. So when X is three, the corresponding Y is one. Okay. We're almost done here. We don't have that much time left in class. Refer to the figure, the axes marked off in, the axes are marked off in one unit intervals. Okay, so the tick marks are of the unit one. What's X when F of X equals five? Okay, so when the y value is five, uh, the corresponding x, so it looks like it's those two horizontal lines going to the left and the right. So to capture those horizontal lines from the left to the right, the far left is negative infinity. It looks like it goes up to four, negative four. And then we combine that with four to infinity, right? So, We're gonna go with the uh, E. I think E should be okay. Let's let's give that one a go. Okay. I always get like anxious to start my weekend when it comes to this class because like it's so close. Like we only have twenty minutes, give or take, a little bit more, and then the weekend officially starts. At least for me, because I'm only working the two days. Um, I know you guys might have other things. It says the diagonal of a square tile uh, is a function. Oh, this is a good one. The diagonal of a square tile is a function of the length x of a side of a square. Write a function rule for the diagonal of a square tile. Find and interpret for. The diagonal of a square tile is a function of a length x of the side of a square. Okay, so if we have a square and we put x on the side, I guess we could use Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> Sorry about that. So let me see. I'll zoom in. That's not enough. Let's get a copy of this. There we go. So from there to here to here. Uh uh. This is what we're looking for. Okay, come on. So we have a square tile. So let's start with a picture. Let's, let's draw an image of a square tile. That's totally not a square, but uh, let me undo. I don't think that's a square either. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's go about here, a bit thicker. Okay, that's good. So we're, we're considering the diagonal, which Gonna run from here to here. Let me do style, this thickness. That's fine. So and it looks like x is the length of the side of a square. All right. Write a function rule for the diagonal. So 
I think we can use Pythagorean theorem, a squared, because keep in mind that this is a 90 degree angle, right? Because it's a square. And that means because it's a square tile, this should also be X. So, and we want to write a function for D of X. So if we invoke for Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus B squared equals C squared, we can say X squared plus X squared equals diagonal squared, right? Combine like terms and take the square root. Now, normally we do plus or minus, but because we're talking about a distance in the context, then we would just take the positive here. So if we take the square root on both sides, that means our diagonal is gonna be, that's a two X squared. So it's gonna be the square root of two X squared. Okay, so for a square tile, we should be able to have something of this form. Okay, let's highlight it. We got the square root of two X squared. So like this, like this. Let me zoom out some. So I'm gonna type square root of two X. I think I can get it like this. Oh, this is two x squared. That's weird. Okay, I'm just totally messing that up. Okay, I think we're okay now. Okay, I hit enter. Let's see. Let's see. Hopefully, it wasn't all that stuff that was happening. Uh, write a function rule for the diagonal of a square tile, find and interpret D of four. Oh, A squared, X squared plus X squared is two X squared. Oh, yeah, you add them together. X squared plus X squared is two X squared. Hmm. Okay, before I try something else, let me see what happened here. It might just be the way I have it typed in there. think about this, is a function of the length x of a side of square, right? Uh, I can't think of why it's not working, unless I just, only other thing I can think is that I typed something wrong. Let me, is that it? Okay, I think maybe I got it. Uh, diagonal is the product of the square root and the length of the side. Right, the area is the length of the side squared. Wait a minute, area, diagonal, yeah. Let's, uh, I'm gonna just try typing. I can't think of anything else. Only thing I could think is I might have did some unnecessary keystrokes somewhere. Let me check my picture one more time. So if we do a Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus B squared equals the diagonal square. So that plus that is two X square root. Oh, well, okay. When you do the square root of X squared, right? When you do the square root of X squared, that's gonna be, they, they cancel each other out. So then it's essentially the absolute value of X. So we can take that a little bit further, right? I, I don't, I feel like what we have is not wrong. But we could take it a step further. This is going to be the square root. Now they might not want the absolute value, but you could say the square root of two times the absolute value of x. But I guess since we're working with the distance, we might not need the absolute value. So we could probably just say it's just going to be square root of two times x. But I'm going to when I submit it, I'm going to submit it. Um, I'm gonna submit it as X times the square root of two, just to make it clear that the X is outside the square root of two, right? Okay, so let's try this one and see how do we, how do we do it? X times the square root of two. Let's try that. So we're gonna say X two, this is good. Okay. So the, the trouble that we were running into before, we weren't simplifying enough, right? 
Because when I saw the two, I was like, well, the two can't go any further. So what's the trouble? Then I was like, oh, I forgot. You could simplify that square root. I mean, that x squared. So the square root of x squared is really absolute value of x, but everything here is positive. So we can, we can lose the absolute value and just say that it's x, okay? That was, that was a good one. So then now with that, uh, when x is four, round to three decimal places. So basically it's gonna be four times the square root of two. So we can do that here. Four times the square root of two. It says round to three decimal places, six, five, six. But that the, the number after the six is an eight. The eight tells us to round up. So it should be 5.657. Five point six five seven. Okay, it was fun. Uh, we got a couple more. We'll, we'll try to finish this out. Let me see. What does this value mean? That's the distance to the diagonal. The diagonal of a square with length side. The diagonal of a square with the side of length four is about equal to this value. Okay, the length of the side of a square whose diagonal. No, we weren't given the diagonal, we found the diagonal, right? So we're gonna go with A. Okay, next question. We're almost there. We're probably just gonna finish out these questions if we can get there in time. It says, a student stuff envelopes for extra money. The initial cost to obtain the information for the job was 160. Each envelope costs two cents and they get paid four cents per envelope stuff. Let X represent the number of envelopes stuffed. Express the cost as a function of X. Express the revenue as a function of X. Determine analytically the value of X for which the revenue equals the cost. It says the student stuff envelope for extra money, their initial cost to obtain the information. So it cost them at least, to get the information, they had to pay $160, all right? So that's like a, a net. It says each envelope costs two cents, all right? So we're gonna say plus 0 0.02 times X. So like if they if they if they stuff one envelope, it costs them two cents plus the one sixty for the information. Right? If they did two, it would be two times the two cents plus the one sixty, so on and so on. Right? So we're gonna go with this one, and then for the revenue, now they earn four cents per stuffed envelope. So then that's just gonna be point. 0, 0.04 times x, all right? So if they, if they stuff one, one, one envelope, they get four cents. Two envelope, eight cents, so on and so on. We're gonna check that. So the revenue equals the cost. So then basically they're asking us to write an equation where we set the cost equal to the revenue and solve. If we set these equal to each other and subtract 0 0.02 on both sides, we'll get 160 equals 0 0.02 x, Divide both sides by 0 0.02. So it's going to be 160 divided by 0 0.02. So the revenue equals the cost. Is that right? They have to stuff 8,000 envelopes before they, they break even? I think so. I think that means they got to stuff 8,000 envelopes before it breaks even. Oh, let's let's just try the 8,000 here. All right, that sounds intense. Unless they had a way of automating it. Okay, we are just about out of time. Oh, was that the last one? Okay, that was the last one. So the timing was pretty good. Okay. So that, so that means, yeah. Like they don't make their money back until they stuff 8,000 envelopes. And then even then it's just breaking even. So then the real question is, you know, how long or how much energy or what does it take? How far beyond 8,000 can they go? And what does it take to go beyond it to maximize their profit, right? But not until they stuff 8,000 envelopes, but everything before that, they're coming out of pocket to do this business, right? They don't start to turn a profit until they get across 8,000. That's, that's intense. But, you know, maybe they might hire somebody else to go and do it and then, you know, let them work it out. And then once they've done the job, 
You see what I'm saying? They can pocket. You might say, okay, they know they got to get to 8,000, right? So then they might hire somebody. They don't turn a profit until they get above 8,000. They can pay them what they want, but then it has to be factored where, okay. Because if, if the person only does 8,000 and they're paying somebody, 8,000 is only to break even. So then they won't, they still won't turn a profit. So now they got to factor in their employee into this scheme and like, okay, how much are they willing to pay? How much can they pay somebody else to do this so that they can turn a profit? So now while this employee is doing it, they can go be doing whatever they want to do. And as long as everything is like set up properly, they can still turn a profit, right? I'm just thinking of ways, how could they automate stuffing the envelopes and still turn a profit? Okay, so with that, that officially brings us to the end of our presentation for today. Um, are there any burning questions? If let me just pause for a moment to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if there so, aren't any burning questions, let me say yes. Um, for the lab, so um, we just we make like um we sign up for the um do the the lab through your do your um portal on Blackboard or yeah. your section. Yeah. Well, yeah, you go to our reporter on Blackboard. On the left-hand side, there's a link that says Online Alex Lab. Click on that link, and you'll see, like, these files, these three documents. Uh, the syllabus is in there, and basically you have, to con her, my, you have to contact my colleague, Dr. Lamar. Her contact information is in one of those documents. And then once you, once you connect with her and she gives you instructions, you basically just do whatever she suggests. And then when it comes to about the midterm and the final, she'll give me a grade for each student. I'll take that grade and I'm going to scale it so that it's worth 10% of your overall grade. Okay. All right, that's it. Thank you. That's a good question. So again, we have two main parts. There's the online Alex lab, like we just described. And then we have Pearson for our part. So it's two different parts at play. All right. Any other burning questions? Okay, as a quick recap, we have exam one that becomes available this upcoming Sunday. Um, I think I scheduled it for 11-11. You get seven days. Uh, may I recommend that you start on it as soon as possible? And then next week when we meet, I'm just going to take attendance and I'm just going to sit on the call in silence. You can, um, I'm really just making myself available so you can ask questions, right? Um, thank you. If there aren't any other burning questions, we're going to end a session here, and from one beautiful mind to another, enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, guys, take care. Peace. Have a good day. As well. Hey, Professor C, did you get my my uh, text or like message in the group chat or the um, the chat? Hello, Professor C. Oh. Oh, okay. The host is me. I am host. Cool. Well, hello, everyone.